Good evening. Welcome everyone. Welcome to the actual play talks today by Ben Spinger and Peter Barber. May I request Mary Jane Rooney, head of the uh, International Outreach Commission at Sector University, to introduce our speakers. Um, thank you very much. Can you hear me at the back, everybody? Is that clear enough? Um, right, so I'm Ben Stringer, and that's Pete Barber. Um, we've been teaching together for about 27 years, something like that. So we, we taught for a long time at, at the, the Bartlett School in London and at Oxford Brooks for a while as well. So um, we know each other very, very well. We're very old, old, old friends. We went to college together as well. Um, but yeah, Pete, Pete um, pushed further and further into... Um, professional practice and I immersed myself more and more into academia so but but we've, we've stayed together as a, as a kind of um, teaching partnership sometimes designing things together um, in, in practice as well um, so let me just um, get my PowerPoint slide up I, um, before I forget I must say thank you very much um, to SEPT um, for allowing us to come and say hello to you it's it's, uh, it's a real privilege this is a very very special um, University, a very special um, city, and um, you know we 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 we've been sort of wowed by by looking around the campus and and what an incredible um, creative environment um, you, you you all work in. Mm -hmm. um, where we come from, we're 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 we're, we're sort of slightly beset by a um, a corporate culture, a business model that that puts tremendous profession, uh, pressure on us all to um, to produce. Um, all the time, and sometimes it takes the the edge off um, the the idea of um, uh, working in, in in a kind of more creative, um, reflective um, studio environment. And so, um, hang on to what you've got, um, please. Right now, I'm just going to go to the full frame. Okay, so Pete is going to be the main course today, so I'm just going to talk for um, hopefully 20 minutes or so, and then, then we're going to, uh, Pete's going to talk about his practice work. And this is the one I want here, isn't it? Um, yeah, so on the left is an example of um, one of Peter's housing projects, and on, on the right is a drawing done by myself and um, my friend and colleague, Jane McAllister. Um, I, I have another... Um, various other little things that I do as well. So that, that's a drawing of a city farm that, that, that I designed and that, that I'm um, a director of. Um, but I'm here mainly to talk about DS12, which is one of um, it's 10 or 11 studios at um, the University of Westminster. It's a master's studio. And it's um, a combination of, as Mary said, of Mary Jane said, is of um, first and second year students. Now, this... Oh, right, okay. I seem to have uh, got jumped to the end all of a sudden. Right, okay, there we go. Right, so now you know what I'm going to talk about. <laughs> right, so look. <clears throat> 
Um, yeah, so this studio has only been, this particular studio um, has only been running for two years. This is the second year. So in effect, it's, it's one and a half years, really. And we were asked by the University of Westminster, uh, Westminster to do a studio about housing, um, which we said yes to. Um, although, um, having said that, the word housing is, is something that's immediately problematic to us because... Um, it indicates you know, ha the idea that housing can be somehow separated from the rest of the city. So we tend to prefer words like um, village and, and town, you know, and, and, and just the idea of, of, of housing that's much more embedded in a, um, a community. You know. you, it, we, we think it's very difficult to design, or, or really silly to design housing, where you're not also addressing questions of um, you know, where, where people are getting educated, um, where people are, are working, where the money is coming from, and, um, and so on. So um, we're, we're, we're very critical of, of, the, um, of the idea that house, of housing as a, a kind of specialist um, uh, field. Although how Pete is a specialist in housing, aren't you, Pete? You do tons and tons of housing. You become it inadvertently. Um, yeah, so... Um, our focus is, is housing in London, and London is, has a very particular set of issues, um, which may seem trivial compared to um, some of the things that are happening in Indian cities. Um, but we, we too have, 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 have a city, like, like some Indian ones, which, which is growing um, by our standards very rapidly, by 100,000 people per year. So um, 2 million people need to be housed in the next 15 um, years or so, um, and this this is, you know, a small amount compared to say Delhi or Mumbai, which which, which have to accommodate um, something like five or six times as many people. Nevertheless, it's perceived as a very serious problem um, in London. Um, now, I'm going to show you. I'm going to talk th through um, our first years. Uh, the project that we did last year, and and introduced the work that's. Um, on display in the room uh, next door. And they're, they're linked, okay, and they're linked, and I'm showing you this map here because um, it's, a, it's, a, it's an aerial view of London, um, and that's the estuary of the River Thames. So this is all in the southeast of, um, of Britain. And um, if you see over here, there is uh, Heathrow Airport, right? It's, it's, it's London's major international airport. And at the moment, um, there's lots of discussion about what the future of this airport is. One of its futures is that it, uh, it has a new runway built. The problem is, is that it, it's reached its capacity. Um, and so there's lots of uh, big political arguments about should it have a third runway or not. And an alternative that's being championed by the mayor of London uh, very, very strongly at the moment is to put um, a new airport on an island in the, um, in the Thames. So last year's project um, really hinges on this um, scenario. So last year we, we, we were sort of opposing the idea that Heathrow... Um, should be replaced by an island airport. And what we were arguing then was that, um, well, why not have an island for housing instead? You know, retain Heathrow, but, but actually, since we're in the business of, of creating islands, why not um, use that as a, as a site for um, alleviating London's housing? Okay, so... Um, alongside that, there are many, many other problems... Um, to do with uh, London's housing. London is very, very, very susceptible to um, global economic movement um, to the extent that um, housing in London has been seen as a, as, a, as a place for international businesses to put their money, to invest in. Um, and this makes it very difficult for Londoners to, to afford to live in their own city. So this map, th I'm going to show you a series of maps which... Um, some academics at King's College have done, which, which is about London housing affordability. Now, what you've got to bear in mind is the purple dots there, um, these are properties which are in excess of 13 times um, the average middle-class um, wage. You know, this is, this is what you have to earn in order to um, buy a house there. The other colours, the, the, um, 
the, the yellows and the, and, the, and, and the pinks and the paler colours are also very, very um, expensive housing. Um, you know, seven times um, the average wage uh, and so on. But look, just look what's happening in the lo even in the last few years. So this is 1997, this is 2002, this is 2007, um, and this is 2012. Okay, this, this last picture is not that distinct, but you can see that London is becoming less and less and less affordable because um, of its attractiveness to um, the market, you know, to out, outside investors. So we have a lot of, um, you know, Russian, American, you know, billionaires from around the world, Chinese billionaires, buying up um, great swathes of, uh, of, of London. Um, and at the same time, um, the idea of social housing, government housing, is really being demonized. Um, I did some work on a, on a, um, a housing estate in the south of London um, a couple of years ago called the Haygate Housing Estate. And um, when I was doing some research on it, I realized that um, I learned that this housing estate had had um, 70 feature films and TV shows filmed within it, okay? And every single one of them was violent, okay? So the last one was, um, was Brad Pitt's um, World War Z, you know, a zombie movie. Um, and this is typical, you know, when, when, when housing projects are displayed in, in Hollywood films, English housing estates, they're always um, very, very sort of dystopian and very, very dark places where people get mugged or, you know, eaten by monsters. Um, or beaten up by weird gangsters and things. And so, so this is what's happening in London. And, and so the social housing stock is shrinking and shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. And um, what's happening is lots and lots of um, big um, new developments, typically of two-bedroom flats, very, very expensive two-bedroom flats. I think one um, sold recently, the Hyde Park one, was it um, over 100 million pounds for one flat overlooking um, a park? Um, and I also read recently that um, the way things are going, the way that prices are, are, are going up and up and up, I think some, in something like the next um, 30 years, the average house price in London is going to be around £5 million. Um, so it's completely beyond the reach of, of ordinary um, people. So this is the environment in which... Um, this, that we're trying to address through our studio. So what do we do about this? And so what we do is, is we tend to do um, urban scale projects, which are notionally kind of housing, um, but um, you can't really just do housing without really addressing these, these kinds of political issues as well, and these, these major social issues as well. So students, all the students who've done those projects out there, they've, they've not only designed those, those projects, but they've also had to ask where the money is coming from and how it's possible to um, devise a kind of urbanism which ordinary people could actually afford to live in. And so most of them are, are kind of quite idealistic and, um, and, and, and having to be very clever politically and economically. Okay, so here are the two, here's um, the two sites that we've um, used. In the first year, um, we, 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 we cited our projects on an island in the estuary. And this year, the projects that are in that room they're on the Heathrow site. So what we did with the second year was um, to ask them to assume that the um, island was going to be built after all, um, the airport island, and that therefore Heathrow, um, the site, would become available as a, a site for a new town. Um, and this is a real scenario, okay? So um, our mayor, Boris Johnson, um, thinks that this is the way to help pay for the new airport is to sell the old airport as a development site. So this will provide funds to build the new, the new place. Okay, so, um, and it's absolutely fascinating to, uh, we, we all walked around um, Heathrow Airport. Um, my slides are, I've, 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 I've jumped to the end here again, haven't I? I don't know why that is, I keep jumping. Am I, Sorry about this. I'm, I'm, I'm getting completely out of sequence. Okay. Right, okay. So on the, back to the islands, all right? Back to the islands. Um, 
Yeah, so there were ma many other things that were influenced our project last year. We called it an archipelago of urbanities because um, we asked our students to d design island settlements in the um, Thames estuary. And one of the things that we were um, influenced by was the, um, the fact that um, a lot of mud is coming out of London because of major construction projects new um, railways, um, underground railways, for example, one called the Crossrail, um, is dumping a lot of mud in the estuary and creating a new um, wildlife island. And we thought we could redeploy that technology to create um, a, uh, a housing island. And we were also inspired by um, historic projects such as the, uh, the Metabolists in Tokyo um, in the 1960s, when there was a housing crisis there, they used it as a, as a catalyst for a very kind of experimental um, architectural culture. This, this was the, uh, the start of a, of, of, um, a very creative um, moment in, in Tokyo's architectural history. Um, but it seems for us at the moment, it, it's, um, our crisis is, is creating a kind of a very conservative uh, environment. So we see our studio as, as really trying to um, do something more similar to the, um, the metabolists and work on that scale and, 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 and treat the um, housing crisis with a similar um, creative impulse. And we were also, uh, we went to Holland to look at um, float houses in the water over there and asked ourselves why, why can Dutch people in Amsterdam have cheap houses where, where we can't. Um, so we learnt a lot from, from Holland and uh, Dutch ways of doing things. And also from historical precedents on the, um, on the Thames. Um, there are some fairly utopian settlements already built on the banks of the Thames, albeit a long time ago. So this one is uh, Batterville, which was uh, a very idealistic kind of shoe company's um, town. So this shoe manufacturing company from Czechoslovakia started up a, a, a company in London and provided everybody with, with housing, with schooling, with cinemas, and so on and so forth. Um, also fascinating to us was the fact that um, if you're not on land, your planning regulations are very, very different to each other. So when you're on land, we, we're, we're governed by, by a very strict set of um, planning codes. When you're on water, you're not. And this is very evident in, in the way that um, in some places you find very, very creative um, DIY um, houses that are on the water, so out of reach of planning authorities. So these two buildings um, are actually right opposite each other um, on, on a, um, a riverside in um, a town in South London, uh, South England. Um, yeah, also um, imp uh, important to us was the idea of utopia. Um, the original utopia, of course, was an island. Um, so um, there's, there's, there's a history of thinking of um, islands as, as a sort of ideal community, something that, that manages to create a, um, a, a sort of existence that, that's outside of the, um, of, of, of the, the normal restrictions of, of, of society. Um, although the flip side of that is, is that um, islands are also a trope for um, nightmares, and they're, 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 they're very commonly... Um, quite often used as, 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 as settings for very mysterious, dark things. You know, you think of Dr. Moreau's island. Um, I've got Godzilla there because he came from a, a strange island, you know, off the sea of Tokyo. So, um, and, and so we, part of our discussion was this idea of, of, of whether, um, how much utopian thought should, should um, student projects in, engage in. And it, it's, a, it's a difficult one. So you think of critics like, um, Rosalind Deutsch and, and many others, they'll argue that um, you shouldn't deal with utopias because utopias nearly always end in a totalitarian um, nightmare. Um, but then the flip side of that is if you only engage in negotiating with, with um, everyday reality, then surely you're, you're just maintaining the status quo. So, so we, we tend to shuttle between those two um, positions in our studio. Um, right, okay, also there are islands in the Thames already and quite a lot of them have a very particular character. These, these images are from Eel Pie Island, which, which was uh, an important place in the development of English rock and roll. Um, 
and some earlier projects from, from early year, years um, were influential. So this is a, a, a sort of a, a London suburb um, about to be swamped by rising um, floodwaters. Um, lots of London is, is under threat from uh, global warming. Um, and um, as sea waters rise, um, there are parts of, of, of the edge of London which, which um, may well go underwater. And so this project is, is, is really um, dealing with um, a, a sort of su suburban um, blasé attitude towards um, uh, rising flood levels. So people are, j are still having a good time no matter what, you know, still determined to maintain a, a, um, a consumer culture. And so um, we might end up with um, lots of uh, floating houses that, that are, um, you know, have, 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 that are actually quite um, light-hearted in their, their approach. Um, it's, this is a sarcastic project, okay? So it, it's, it's, it's meant to be a, a critique of, of, of our inability to take um, global warming seriously. Um, right, okay. So um, I'll show you a few of the projects that, that students did. So we did get lots of um, very interesting kind of island projects. So this one is by a guy called Glauco Borel, who developed a, um, a, a sort of a modular island, you know, these, these, these prefabricated hexagonal um, elements that, that bolted together to produce this very interesting um, um, emergent kind of city. Another similar type of project was by um, Leftos Dusis, which is kind of like a stretched, um, stretched kind of habitat. You know, Moshe Safdie's habitat is like a stretched version of that. These these settlements have about 20, uh, imagined to have about 20,000 people in them. Here's another one. This is this is by Alex Whedon. This is this has a slightly different uh, premise. Um, some of our students decided not to. Um, do islands as such, um, but rather to address this issue of rising flood water. So this, this student um, imagined uh, um, an area which is threatened with, with flooding and building taller buildings on top of the existing ones. And so this, this became a, uh, like a kind of a new Venice um, in his mind. Then we have this one. This was one by somebody called Alastair Struthers. And his approach was, um, was very interesting as well. He was nominated for a, a, um, an ROBA silver medal. But what, what he did was he, he, his idea was to continue the, 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 the fabric of um, a, a riverside town called Gravesend into the, um, the River Medway, which is a, an offshoot of the Thames and use that as a, as a means of deconstructing um, existing um, uh, housing patterns and existing street patterns and patterns of consumption. There's another one of his images. Um, and this one is by uh, a, a guy called Freddie Jackson, and what his idea was was to create a, a dam to actually stop um, the water coming into the, um, the Thames in the first place. But what, what this dam would be an inhabited one, so why, why not create a, a, a barrage, but actually house these, these millions of people that, that are, are, are coming to London, but within this dam. And um, this, this drawing, it's, it's slightly unfinished, but it's, it's a drawing that's very important um, to me. It's a type of drawing that's very important. Um, it's a sectional perspective. <clears throat> and what I like about this kind of drawing is is its ability to show what's, what's up close, to show inside a, um, a project and to show the ordinary, everyday life of a place, but also to put it in uh, within a much, much um, wider, wider context. So this, this is a type of drawing that um, is um, re really sort of central to, to the way that, that I think. Um, and I think it's very important generally for architects to learn how to um, operate at all scales and to understand um, the relationship between um, the very small and the very big, you know, to, to put architecture within a, a regional, an urban, and um, a neighborhood environment, and to understand 
that the forces that, that are acting at all these different scales are quite often conflicting with each other. Um, and so, there we are. I'm going to finish up fairly soon. So this drawing on the right is another drawing by Freddie Jackson. It's, it's, it's also a drawing that um, I'm very fond of um, because it, it shows... Um, to some extent, a real person. You know, in, in architecture, we, 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 we tend to um, work with ideal people. And, and this is clearly somebody who's been having a hard time, um, has drunk too much, and um, is presumably depressed or distressed by something, you know. And I just really enjoy the idea of, 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 of learning from, um, from, say, cartoonists like Chris Ware and so on. Um, and to include that in the way that we represent space and the way, the way that we represent um, uh, life in our projects. Okay, so um, the Heathrow project that, that these guys sitting over there have, have um, assembled in the room next door, this assumes that Heathrow Airport becomes disused and it becomes available as, as a setting for new, um, a new, new kind of city. So they're all dealing with... Um, projects that assume a population of around about 200,000 people. And um, it's a very, very complex site, and they've, they've, they've all walked around the, the perimeter of the whole airport, which is uh, about five or six miles um, in, in both directions. Um, and what we find is it's, it's a real kind of state of the nation kind of project. So, on the west of, of Heathrow, it's, 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 it's reaching into London, the city of London, and on the east of Heathrow, it's, it's really pushing out into the countryside. And um, that's like a sort of an important uh, conceptual border as well as an important real border. Um, so in the west, we have this area of, of, of Hounslow, which is very typical London. London apparently is, is the most multicultural city in the world. Um, and to the east, we have this, uh, you know, what some people would call, in inverted commas, you know, a sort of an authentic kind of English village. But one really has to ask, what's, what's authentic um, uh, here? And what, what's happening here is there's a sort of a shift, I think, between um, an idea of um, a place that's um, connected to the rest of the world. Um, it, it, it has a sort of a global, um, global reach and... It, it, to me, you could, as, as, as well as putting west and east here, you could almost put space and place here because we, we change our way of um, thinking in England when we go into the countryside. We expect things to be very localized, to, to have uh, kind of historic roots and so on and so forth. But we don't expect that so much when we're in, when we're in, the, um, in the city. So there's a conceptual shift that happens. Um, on either side of the site that our students are dealing with. Similarly, um, when one's in the rural territory, one's allowed to make a mess, one has space, one can, um, can leave things lying around outside your house, um, and that's completely different to the highly ordered, highly mechanized uh, kinds of space that we are familiar with in, um, in airports. Um, yeah, so that is essentially the, um, the project. So I'm going to leave it there, and um, if you want to find out more, I suggest you talk to our students um, after our talks and go and go and meet them in, in the room um, next door, because they can explain their projects much better than I can. Um, so that's it. So I'm going to introduce you now to Peter Barber, and um, he's going to talk about some, um, some real projects, some real housing that he's been working on in, in, in London. So thanks very much. Thanks, Ben. I'd like to, uh, to echo Ben's uh, thanks to this institution for, uh, for having us here. Um, we've had an amazing time in, in this city, um, seen some incredible pieces of town and some wonderful 20th century architecture, and um, what, a treat it, what a treat it's been. Um, so Ben and I have talked together for nearly 30 years, and... Um, as Mary Jane was saying, the sort of interesting reciprocal relationship which exists between academia and practice, and I think a lot of um, people who run academic institutions think, that, think they're going to get a lot from having practitioners coming in to, 
to teach, but I also think, to, actually to a greater extent, that practice can get an awful lot from being involved in academia. And my practice has really, really benefited from an involvement with various teaching institutions. Uh, but the constant in that has been my connection with Ben, who um, is, a, is a proper sort of thinker about architecture. And um, his, his sort of help um, with in, in very sort of specifically with the design of some of these projects, but also setting up a sort of helping me to set up a sort of series of sort of polit political and ideological positions which help to govern what I do in practice has been really pivotal. And so I'm going to show you some, some, some pictures of built projects. But before I kick off uh, with those, I want to just share with you some of the ideas which underpin the work of my practice and, and the, the, the things that have sort of inspire me and make, help me to think about how to design projects. Um, and, and so this is a series of um, quotes, but also some pictures of places in, the, in, in, in our city which, um, which have inspired me. And um, so the first of these is a quote um, which is never far from, from my thoughts when I'm thinking about trying to design uh, projects. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a short passage from a book called One Way Street, which is by Walter Benjamin, who was a great philosopher uh, and sort of um, uh, cultural critic, you'd say, from the early part of the 20th century. Uh, and he wrote a wonderful book, uh, Walter Benjamin, wrote, wrote a wonderful book called One Way Street in 1924, in which he describes um, in each of the chapters a different European city. And the, 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 the passage, the, the chapter that really inspires me uh, is, is, a, is, a, is a description of the city of Naples, um, which actually could be a description of the old city of uh, the, the old part of Ahmedabad, a dense kind of street paced um, urban environment in which people live, they work, they manufacture things. Um, but, but, but what really, in, in the sort of um, conceptual terms, I find fascinating is the way that in his description of that city, he collapses. Um, a description of, of, of the spaces of the city with a description of how people use that city. So he was fascinated, I think, in his description of Naples with the idea uh, of the relationship between, and it's a reciprocal relationship and, and a fragile relationship, which he is describing, that the relationship between people and architecture, between, between culture and space. So he's talking about an architecture which is sort of animated and activated by people, which becomes fascinating in use, uh, and, and as really si uh, cities and architecture being remarkably uninteresting until they are a sort of uh, have life breathed into them by people. Anyway, he puts it better than me. So we're in Naples, or we're in old Ahmedabad, okay, here. Um, he says this, the passion for improvisation, which demands that space and opportunity be at any price preserved. Buildings are used as a popular stage. They are all divided into innumerable simultaneously animated theatres. Balcony, courtyard, window, gateway, staircase, roof are at the same time stages and boxes. So it's a kind of, kind of theatrical scene, a sort of, a sort of full of life and vitality. He goes on to say, as porous as the stone is the architecture. Buildings and action interpenetrate in the courtyards, arcades, and stairways. In everything, they preserve the scope to become a theater of new unforeseen constellations. The stamp of the definitive is avoided. No situation appears intended forever. And so that's Walter Benjamin's way of talking about a city which is permeable, which invites occupation. And uh, you know, when I'm staring at a blank sheet of paper with a sort of side of A4 describing a brief, I try to imagine people occupying the spaces that I'm trying to create and sort of understand, thinking in, ter thinking in terms of this wonderful, exciting, reciprocal relationship, people and architecture, culture and space. So as we go through the built projects, you know, I I'll probably be revisiting that quote and talking about it a little bit, but um, uh, and it's endlessly inspiring for me. Um, this is a picture that I drew recently. Uh, um, somebody was, uh, uh, you know, we, there's all, as Ben said, there's all this development going on in London at the moment, and a great deal of it is kind of objecty buildings sitting in the middle of space. And um, I drew this because it's a way of achieving a very high density of, of architecture 
with using a city which is kind of street based. And um, what I have discovered um, in the course of kind of doing this work and doing this research and thinking about cities and architecture and housing is that in a city like London, and I don't know how it compares with, with cities here, 70% of all the buildings in London are houses or housing, okay? So housing and houses are what create our streets. It's what surrounds our squares. It's what creates kind of intimate, congested space within the city. So when we are approached by, by clients to think about doing a housing scheme, we always, always encourage them to, you know, if it's in an urban context, to think of it in terms of urban design rather than housing, and think of, of the con spatial consequences for the city of what we're doing. And so this is my vision of an alternative way of doing housing in London to what is being done at the moment, which is a lot of it quite high-rise stuff with lots of space around it. It's pushing it down to four stories, compressing public space into streets, and creating kind of squares like this, which are quite intense. Um, and, and so, yes, yeah, street-based, lower-rise, but high-density street-based housing, I find a fascinating proposition. And um, so, so it's connected with that as an idea and a fascination with the idea of, of public space and, and what public space is. And obviously a lot of kind of learned stuff has been written about that. But for me, there's the sort of the simple kind of some simple ideas which make me fascinated by, by what public space is. And um, this is... A, uh, 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 the, the great sort of public space at the edge of, of Marrakesh in Morocco. And, and I love the idea that public space sort of belongs to everybody and it belongs to nobody too. It has that kind of peculiar uh, quality to it. And, um, you know, and I, and I often find it interesting and useful to look at pre-existing situations to understand them, a sort of empirical kind of way of looking at, at, at architecture. And, um, and, and to think about what's happening. So this, you know, particularly in the cool of the evening, um, the city kind of empties out into this wonderful space, which is really a clearing at the edge of the city. It's not a space which has anything really to do with monumental uh, architecture or powerful architecture, but it's about the people who inhabit it. And it's a really sort of ephemeral, it's an architecture of ephemerality, it's an architecture of performance and, and you know, I suppose in that sense it connects with the sort of theatrical vision that Walter Benjamin was giving us. And you know, um, the, the, uh, you know in the cool of the evening little, little pieces of sort of temporary architecture coming out in the forms of kitchens, of stages where people are doing performance, um, you know, snake charmers, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, storytellers, musicians. and. Um, so it's, it's kind of created by the people who are there. And, and one of the sort of things that makes this more interesting still is that uh, it's got a fantastic name, which is Jamal Fana. And you know, Jamal Fana, one of the translations of that is a mosque of nothing. And I love the idea of public space being a, a, being pla a, a place where people can sort of be themselves. And it's a space which is to some extent at least kind of a, a, a space where people can be free and express themselves. Uh, uh, and um, uh, it, 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 so Gemma Alpha, a, a mosque of nothing, and this very ephemeral kind of theatrical space of people kind of just moving around. Uh, and this photograph, it, it, the, the vision, the, the sort of idea is sort of cemented by the fact that behind us is, is, the, is the mosque of Marrakesh. And if, and if this space is about sort of movement and fluidity and ephemerality and changing kind of space, uh, it, the, its counterpart is in the mosque of, 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 of the Grand Mosque of Marrakesh, kind of fixed to the ground, solid, immutable, uh, and, and ideas which are more fixed. And so that, there's a sort of nice antithesis in, in, in that and the space that is next to it. Um, so, so the other thing I've sort of hinted at is a, is a fascination with the, uh, the idea of the street. And blimey, I, what can I tell you about that? We're, we're staying in the old town, this, the old town here. And um, uh, but, but I think things which are familiar are sometimes just worth looking at. So we, we take for granted the idea of a street. Uh, but um, I think it's just worth reflecting uh, on uh, things in order to sort of tease out a kind of empirical understanding. So this is a, this is a street in Brighton, in the south of England. And by British standards, it's a, it's a space which is kind of teeming with people. 
and it's got lots of good things happening about it. I think streets are a really good way of organising urban space because they tend to create an easily understood and legible means of moving around the city, you know, a well-connected city, so that we can understand it. Um, another thing that happens with streets is they tend to sort of compress public space into kind of limited space, and what that will do is it will tend to bring people from different backgrounds, different social groups, uh, different ages, uh, uh, different, different races potentially, into close proximity with each other. It's a kind of spatiality which is quite sociable and which tends to kind of bring people together. And, you know, um, that's worth kind of making that observation because I think it's really, really important. Another thing that's happening on a street like this uh, is that there are lots of things happening on it. There are people living there, there are offices there, there's a pub on the corner, there are shops. It has a life sort of 24 hours a day. Um, uh, 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 what else have we got here? We've got a space which is very well overlooked. It's, it's a place with a lot of people in it. Um, and in the context of a series of slides that I'm going to show you next, it's a place where people can feel quite safe and feel as though they're connected with other people. Um, we've got lots of spaces which aren't like this in London, and some of them are a consequence of sort of post-war planning. Uh, uh, London was hit very hard by bombing in, in the Second World War. And that, uh, that sort of destruction came at the same time as a sort of drive for the reconstruction of the city or parts of our city according to sort of more modernist principles which tended to reject this, in my view, sort of um, really important type, a way of organising space for something else. And I'm going to take you on a little walk through a post-war housing estate um, fairly close to... Uh, the, you know, at one of the centres of London, Shoreditch. Um, and it is a place which, by contrast with the slide that I've just showed you, tends to create a sort of separation from the rest of the city. It's not a place that anybody really automatically walks through. Uh, there are no easy ways through it. Um, and it tends to isolate its inhabitants from the rest of the city. The problem here is that this is a place which is, qu is, is quite sort of, it, it's, it's a place where people on very low incomes tend to live, it's a social housing project, and so it's a, it, they're sort of hidden away, uh, and, I, and I think um, that's a real problem, it, you know, to, to design a city in which people are kind of isolated and separated is the wrong way to design a city, and the idea of people being brought together in, in, in a way where, where, where which tends to encourage kind of interaction between different types of people is much better. So here we are walking through this, and it's patches of grass, bits of concrete, funny little snickets through. Um, you see very few other people because it's not on a route anywhere. It's kind of a series of dead ends. And the only people that really go here are people who live here or their visitors. You know, public space really poorly overlooked. And so, um, you know, a lot of people, uh, and we worked on this estate with the residents of the estate, there were people who said they were frightened to kind of walk around in this, in this quite sort of, um, for some people, intimidating environment because they felt very alone and very prone to sort of crime. And, um, you know, particularly women, uh, uh, youngsters, um, more vulnerable people, uh, you know, voiced these kind of concerns and fears. So it has a massive impact a poorly laid out piece of city, a badly designed piece of housing on the people who live there. And this was built in the 1960s, you know, two or three generations ago now, of people have, uh, you know, they've, they've sort of laboured under the sort of, the pressure created for them by this sort of urban environment. Uh, and they will continue to do so because there's no plans to change this place. And I eventually found another human being in the half an hour that I walked <laughs> through there, which was kind of a relief. And he was surprised to see me as I was to see him. Um, so it's just, I just wanted to show you that, to show you the difference between a kind of street-based urbanism and this other kind of strange world that uh, people seem to want to create in that period in London in the 60s and 70s. And to some extent, they are coming back to uh, and not sticking to some basic principles about street-based cities. And these are some examples of, of places that I really like. This is in Brighton, back of pavement terrace housing um, and people sort of taking control of the space in front of their homes. Um, and this in central London near to Tottenham Court Road. So when we're designing our housing projects, 
one's looking at these sort of precedents as pieces of city which, in my view, are working better. And, um, you know, I'm a great one for, for, um, for, for just walking around with my eyes open and trying to learn from pre-existing situations. And this is a project uh, in south-east London uh, which was going to be bulldozed, actually, because it was considered to be substandard housing. Thankfully, it was saved. The people who lived there got together and they refused to leave and it was saved. But this is fascinating to me for that reason, but also because this is at second floor level and there's a street in this sort of chasm down here. But these are spaces on top of roofs which are people have turned into roof terraces. And um, you'll see, as I start to show you the project, so this is an idea which I find really fascinating uh, and the, uh, the idea that within a sort of dense uh, environment that people could have a little piece of space to sort of sit outside which is private to them. So this brings me to the first of the built projects which I'm going to show you and some of the things that I've been talking about, in fact all of the things I've been talk talking about sort of reside within this project. So um, this is uh, in the east end of London and the site is this, okay? And it won a, a, won a big architectural competition for 15 years ago or so. And uh, the, 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 the competition asked for housing. And to some extent it is housing. But we said in our competition entry um, uh, that our sort of strap line was this, our, our proposal is a celebration of the public social life of streets. And so we tried to think of it as a little urban quarter rather than as an object building. And many of the other competition entries sort of popped a building in the middle of there, surrounded by space. We did the opposite. We created a, a couple of spaces at the centre of the site, uh, and we made a hard edge of housing to this existing street and to that street there. Um, and we, we made two cross-site routes, which intersected the square. So this is a route which kind of connects it, the project with this. This is a route which kind of feeds up through here into a diagonal loom. And, and so it's, it's designed to sort of encourage a connection with its immediate surroundings um, uh, by virtue of its kind of, the way it's organised urbanistically. It's a scheme which in a sense is a grid, um, but um, London has sort of complex geometries to do with its history. And so there are other things happening here, although there's a sort of grid of housing here. There's a sort of slow curve on this street, which we've, which we've held on to. This is a busier street, and we've put some shops on the ground floor here. Um, and you know, there's the possibility of creating this connection through here, which necessitated this, these funny-shaped sort of urban blocks. So these peculiar forms are derived from a sort of an understanding, a very simple level, uh, of the geometries of the site. And um, a lot of housing in London is, is terraced housing, OK? You have a you have a three four story two three four story terrace with a back garden. Um, terraced housing is quite land, land hungry in in the context of London because we have very draconian planning laws which mean that a terrace of houses which are back to back to each other have to have 25 or so meters between them. Very very big garden space behind them. Uh, we're not allowed to kind of do that. And uh, and the reasoning for that is if somebody's looking out of their back window that they can't see people in the house behind. And so what Donnybrook does, what this project does, as well as doing things sort of urbanistically which are relatively unusual in London, contemporary London housing, is it's developed a new typology uh, which is a kind of hybrid of a courtyard and a terrace. And what that means is this, is that, um, so there's the streets through the middle of the project, here's the streets around the edge, there are the shops I talked about. But these buildings are actually only eight metres back to back. And um, we get around that by the fact that the ground floor unit has a garden. That ground floor unit has a garden here. But they're separated by a wall, which means you can't see into each other's flat. Uh, so that's a ground floor flat. But then there's an upper, two-story upper maisonette. So all these courtyards are at first floor level. And they look out over the street and they look into their own private courtyard. There are no significant windows in the back, which means we're able to do this. And what that means is we do have terrace housing, which is relatively uh, high density. Um, so I'm going to rush through some snaps of this project. We work a lot with models in our office, physical models. I think there's no substitute. Physical models can give you something uh, which, in my view, uh, you know, a computer model can't. This is an image of the, of the built project. Um, Terrace of, of, of housing, which um, 
creates all of these courtyards at ground and first floor. Uh, the buildings rise a little higher on the, on the wider street frontage with shops on the ground floor. And really interested in the kind of overlap between the public space of the dwelling and the street. And so uh, the orthodoxy at that time was great little front gardens. And we, we, we put our buildings right onto the street front. Uh, in, in a way which creates quite an intimate relationship between the dwelling and the street itself. And as I said, although there's a grid, there is a sort of a, a kind of a, uh, an understanding of the city in, in sort of picturesque or, or filmic terms of, of, of sort of uh, views of, of, of the thing opening up as you walk around it. So sort of prominent corners, something special happens, a curve. Um, this is the back-to-back -back with the gardens. You know, this is before people moved in. And, you know, in a, way, in a, in a, a series of slides, which I think, again, Walter Benjamin would have approved of, um, this thing having a sort of life arising out of, uh, of people's occupation. The landscape becoming more developed, people making use of these gardens in a way which, you know, is, is fantastic to see. And the courtyards, albeit quite small spaces, are, are, are really loved, a lot of them. And then, so the other thing I wanted to talk about a little bit, and it relates back to the Walter Benjamin, is this idea of occu the occupation of, of buildings. And, um, and, and that when we design our buildings, we try to sort of have an understanding of how they might be used. Of course, as an architect, we do things, and, and when we do them, we ha say we have an idea about what might happen. Of course, this relationship isn't causal. We can't make things happen as architects. We can provide the possibility of something happening and we can hope that something might happen. So those courtyards, we're delighted when people kind of use them and put plants in them and things like that. This is one which backfired, and, um, but, but in a nice way. So we had this idea of putting in each front door a little window. And of course, when people are, answer their front door, uh, they don't want to necessarily be seen by who's coming to their front door. And so all of these little windows have been kind of locked up, but in a really nice way, and, and so, so something of people's kind of identity becomes... Um, <laughs> that's the architect's house. <laughs> so that was totally unexpected and, and really, really uh, fantastic. So, I mean, I'm going to uh, rush through these. This is, a, this is a scheme on a larger scale. Uh, which we did roughly at the same time as Donnybrook, and it's, an, it's another scheme where we thought we encouraged our client to think of the sort of urban <laughs> possibilities of creating some new housing. Uh, they came to us and said these blocks need to come down; they're kind of falling apart, uh, and we want to do some new housing. Let's get some new housing done. And we said it was a fantastic opportunity to think about transforming this environment, which in many ways was quite challenging to the people who live there. It's a very busy sort of pedestrian particular route through from sort of suburban East End uh, to the uh, town centre over here. And uh, we kind of noticed this ladder of housing and we wondered about the possibility of replicating uh, this housing down to the rail line. And so there are the existing blocks kind of designed in that sort of high modern principle of being absolutely north facing east west, so this uh, morning sun, afternoon sun. But we've really little thought about the sort of social consequences of some of these spaces uh, at the bottom. And so we just sort of did the dumb thing, really, and just, kind of, again, replicated this uh, pattern of suburban housing uh, on the site itself with a couple of new streets, uh, a little square at the sort of intersection of a whole bunch of cross-site routes, and quite importantly, the introduction of terrace of housing, which uh, removed, effectively removed the railway line from the picture. So a site really dominated by noise, dust from the railway, uh, it, it kind of disappears behind this terrace of housing. A whole bunch of different uh, types of housing. There's some town houses here, you know, single family houses, but some flats stacked up on top of each other. Double, uh, double stack flats, ground floor flat with a rear courtyard, upper flat with a front courtyard. Um, <coughs> and the square with the taller, taller buildings on the square and the community centre down here. Um, a pretty, so pretty hard edge really. And again, this is, this is as the project is, is completed. But going back there and seeing people kind of taking, making use of the street in a way um, which I, I, I'm not sure they did in, 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 in this site's previous um, 
as it was previously. So this is another a social housing project in Stepney Green uh, at the back of an um, existing uh, block of council housing. Some quite interesting but kind of tough architecture. Uh, and this was a space at the rear which was garages which were kind of un unused and we developed the idea with our kind of terrace of housing running along this side of it. And we got really interested in these sort of bits of homemade architecture, fences and sheds and, and all that sort of jazz. And we decided to make that to try and our architecture belong to that world in some way by using timber as the building material. And these are the existing fences. And here's our proposal for eight or nine uh, new houses, quite large houses along that western edge of the site uh, with the creation of a, of a garden in the middle for the to be shared by new residents and the existing residents. And again, we're interested in the idea of, again, these, these are taken early on, the, the front of the building kind of, being, kind of being kind of taken over by people's stuff. So each of these is a house. They don't have a garden. They have a shared use of this space. But also these terraces, which we hope at the time uh, will kind of, uh, another layer of occupancy will be kind of overlaid onto the existing, onto the uh, new building. So these little timber tiles, we call them shingles. They're quite an unusual um, building material for London. So this is a, a project which is also street-based, but it's at a different scale. Um, this is a, a state in North London <coughs> which is quite uh, problematic in the way that it's laid out. We have done a proposal which is over here, which retains a lot of the existing buildings either side, but the central area which is kind of quite problematic in, in, in kind of how it kind of works in terms of public space, is replaced with a ladder of streets. And the building which we built is, is the first part of this, which is a kind of urban block uh, with a supermarket and some shops around the bottom of the ground floor and 50 or so flats. This is a first floor level, the gardens at first floor level. And, uh, and it creates a square in front with this sort of colonnade of um, sort of aerofoil type columns. But, um, also, it's interesting in uh, creating uh, topography of, 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 of roof terraces and balconies. And, um, yeah. So this is quite recently completed. And the colonnade at the front is very sort of public spirited in the way that it creates a sort of uh, kind of generous space to the, to the square. So we do a lot of work with um, homeless people, and in, uh, in, in London, it um, doesn't always work, but for a lot of uh, the time, um, there are places, buildings, which are run by local authorities, by councils, for people who are destitute, who are living on the street, and if they need to come out of the cold and be looked after, uh, buildings like this do that. Many of them are very old, they're kind of 100 or so years old, and many of them are kind of, you know, they're not, they're not very cheerful. Uh, they were, they're, they're, they're kind of the uh, absolute basic minimum uh, and in, a, in the concept of a, a wealthy city, city like London, I don't think that's good enough. And so uh, we have been, we've been asked by a couple of uh, clients, local authority clients, uh, to refurbish existing buildings of this type. This is one in uh, Kentish Town in North, in North London, uh, which currently sort of has spaces like this. This is how you get to your, to your bedroom and it sort of does your head in with it. Uh, and we wondered about another way of organising it. So these kind of very dark, deep kind of spaces uh, and, and a depressing environment for people, many of whom who have uh, mental health problems uh, or, or uh, kind of have been, uh, kind of been living on the street, perhaps have drug or alcohol problems. And so these people who, who need help, they need uh, tender, loving care. And so this is the, the idea of a garden uh, being at the centre of the project. The existing building is here on the street, and we've created uh, a series of tiny houses around, around the garden. And that's the kind of vision of, of how we hope it might be. And the idea is that the garden is a place where the people who live in the estate, can, can, uh, in the hostel, can engage with people who can help them. And, and I wrote this at the time of, 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 of creating this uh, design. We imagine a group of residents 
working with the gardener to create and maintain an intensely planted and beautiful garden. There would be an apple tree or two, potatoes, green veg, soft fruit, herbs, a greenhouse, a potting shed, and a sunny spot to sit and rest. We think that there ought to be a little room or shed for private chats and counselling. The garden creates a homely domestic atmosphere in the hostel. It will give participating residents an interest and outlet for their energy, and it will help to foster a sense of belonging, self-worth and empowerment amongst residents. It will provide people with an opportunity to, to develop gardening skills and to encourage them to think about nutrition. So uh, it's not just simply putting a roof over people's head, it's, it's trying to work with people whose lives have come off the rails a bit um, to sort of get themselves sorted out. So if they've got health problems, if they've got housing problems, uh, if they've got mental problems, th th this is an environment in which people can be engaged with to try to help them to kind of sort themselves out. So each of those is a tiny miniature house. It's a kind of well-established historic typology of housing, which we call arms houses uh, in, in London. And, and it was a... Uh, again, sort of houses round a garden, so uh, this is what we... And this is rather unusual in, 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 in uh, contemporary uh, homeless provision. Usually it's kind of like, more like a hotel. So the idea of these little houses round a garden is kind of unusual and quite nice, I think. But they're miniature. I, you know, you can virtually touch the walls uh, across here. This is a section, and each house has a tiny uh, kitchen, sitting space, So minimum. And, um, you know, they're building it. So although we have a terrible government at the moment in uh, England, there are still people within local authorities, local government, who have a, a, a kind of commitment to uh, improving the lot of, of, of people who, are, who have the misfortune of being, you know, very, very poor. And um, uh, so there we are. So each one has a sort of stable door. Right. I'm going to flash through this one. It's, uh, it's, a, it's another project which uses a courtyard. I'm fascinated by courtyards. There's nothing I can tell you guys about courtyards, but it's a relatively unusual way of organising buildings in our country, not but in contemporary sort of settings. Uh, and this is a project which also looks after uh, <coughs> poor people, homeless people, and it has several different agencies working in it. And so we, this is an existing building, we just came up with the idea of creating a courtyard within this space, which is here. And what it means is that as people circulate around the building, there's the possibility of people engaging in unplanned situations. They don't need to sort of book meetings with each other, they can just sort of run into each other and get chatting, and uh, their sort of shared endeavours are much more powerful than they would be as individuals. So it's an existing building in part which we patch together and create some new buildings. It's an architecture kind of solidity and, and permanence, which um, is kind of another kind of feature of a lot of, of the work of our practice. It tries to achieve this kind of sense of being rooted. You know, you might, um, yeah. And one of the sort of space training spaces of the project. And again, great to see, you know, stuff like that going on in there. Okay, um, so this is a, a housing project which we're currently working on and is about to start on site. And it's back-to-back -back housing. You know, I was describing a situation in which you had to have great big open space between the back of one house and the back of another. This is a, a type which actually has a house there off this street and another house there off this street. And it's a way of achieving very high densities with terraced housing. You, you dispense with the rear garden all together. And it's an idea that's borrowed again from historical precedents. Back to back housing was uh, ubiqu ubiquitous kind of uh, housing type in the Victorian period. It was banned in, in I think, 1910. It, it persisted as a type that was used for creating low cost housing for relatively poor people, particularly in the north, in the north of England and the Midlands. And I think it's a type that's worth revisiting. <laughs> As, as a way of achieving quite high densities without building great big towers. And a way of achieving quite high densities while kind of creating a kind of very street based uh, and intensely that creates a public space. So, so there's a row of houses. 
And there's a row of houses from this side. Each house has a kind of arched front which creates a space at the front of the house. Creates sort of, it's a housing type which is which suit people are quite gregarious and quite like living in the public environment. Uh, and the kitchen, bedroom, bedroom, and then the living room on the top, which has a little private courtyard at the top of the building. I'm really interested in this idea of the sort of stoop, you know, sort of American idea of a kind of stoop at the front of a building. Um, um, so, it's a, a, or a porch. So, these spaces at the front of each of the houses we hope will become places that people actually use. And so, this is on site now. I'm going to leave you with some images of a project which is kind of really an ideas project. But it's a site that's being fought over in central London between the kind of developers that Ben was talking about who are creating housing for overseas investors to come in, buy, perhaps use for a week, a year, or rent out. Uh, to, uh, uh, and, and another way of thinking about that same site, about it being a piece of embedded kind of urbanism on, uh, on narrow streets where people uh, on low incomes could live. So this would be social housing, sub subsidised housing by the local authority, which is Camden. Um, and um, one of the functions of this kind of housing is that in order to achieve quite high densities, you, the way you do it is by creating quite intense and narrow public spaces. And um, you know, the, the attack that people make on this kind of housing is, well, you can't really do narrow streets in England because you know, the light's so poor and it kind of rains and it's, you know, how are you going to get light into people's houses? My sort of counter-argument is, again, kind of open your eyes, go out, have a look round, this is Artillery Row. It's probably one of the most valuable streets in, in central London. And, you know, you could touch the houses on either side. So there is no reason, in my mind, why you can't do an urbanism of this kind. And, it, and in fact, I think there are really good reasons for doing it. Uh, going back to this idea of sort of compressing public space, bringing people close together in a much more kind of sociable environment. This is Mayfair, you know, another area of London where, you know, you can only dream about owning a property. Covent Garden. So this is our proposal for that site. Uh, it's in King's Cross. Um, it's, there's an existing building here which has to remain. But these are all little courtyard houses, two and three storeys high. And these little alleyways which crisscross the site, connecting with adjacent uh, neighbourhoods. And you can see the difference in scale between Victoria and London and our little tiny kind of houses, which kind of probably have a more of a medieval scale to them. Uh, and the opening up of this uh, plan in certain places into little squares. Um, and the whole roof becomes a garden. So each person, the roof of each person's house becomes a garden. And you know, one's kind of looking at other people who encourage this kind of work. So Camille Cité at, at the beginning of the last century thinking about the city as, as being a work of art and as a public space feeling like it's, it's, it's like an interior. So when you create a very enclosed public space like this, it has a sense that it's almost like an interior. Uh, and his spaces, typically, he had very small openings into these spaces. So he was designing his kind of urbanism at the time with a lot of pressure in modern cities to sort of, to, to kind of give privilege to cars and to vehicles and to, and to transportation. And he was thinking about these, these places being about sort of how, about people and about kind of ritual and where it's connected with these public buildings around them. So it's a counterblast to kind of industrialization of the city. <laughs> and so that's our project. So these are the alleyways, those are courtyards, these are roof gardens, it pops up in places. It's not all two and three stories around the edge, it's a six, seven story high uh, terrace apartment buildings with an arcaded frontage which has shops and factories. And, and workspaces. Um, so we're, we're thinking of it as a piece of city, uh, but the, unfortunately, the development that will go up there will be three or four big apartment blocks and with very little non residential use there. Here's our arcade. And, and sort of moving between models and little sketches <coughs> looking down an alleyway into the kind of space that I was describing, which almost feels like an interior. It's an exterior space which you walk, walk through into, the, into our into the new town. Um, you know, two alleyways dividing at a, at, a, at, a, at a point. A drawing which is quite fun, kind of perhaps it's planned into, into perspective, I quite like that. And, and one of the courtyards. <coughs> and we, we demonstrated that we could get the same number of homes as the developer proposal of, of, 
of putting these big blocks on, 700 or so little courtyard houses. And I'll leave you with this. I mean, Ben showed this one. I love this slide. It's a, it's a, it's a rarity in this country. It's probably more common here of people just taking control of their own environment and making houses that they want to make. It's very, very difficult to do that in England because of all sorts of reasons, not least the, sort of the, the cost of buying land, the constraints put on us by planning authorities preventing us from doing things. But I, I like this project, you know, particularly in the context of all the images I've just been showing you of housing designed by architects and by, built by developers and local authorities, very top, <coughs> top down. This is somebody taking control of their world, and for, their, for that person, this is their dream. It's come true. You know, they put a, a coach on top of a boat and they've sawn it in half to make it wide enough for a living room, and the, the bedroom's down here. And it's uh, somebody's, somebody's dream, you know. And uh, I, I think it's interesting uh, because um, when we make housing in, in London, and I, it may be that th this is the challenge you have as well, we're sort of distanced from the people we're making the housing from. We have to imagine a kind of Mr. and Mrs. entirely normal and, and sort of try to create an environment which will suit anybody. And the possibility of doing something like that's difficult. And so, you know, we're wondering in London, some of us, about the possibility of a sort of cooperative housing movement in which individuals can buy pieces of land, whether it's from the government or from private developers, or people can group together. I discovered that in Uruguay, for instance, 60% of all the social housing is built by cooperatives who can get money from the government, poor people who can get money from the government, employ their own designer, their own architect, and build the houses that they want to have rather than something that's visited on them from above. And so that's why I've shown this. And um, you know, Karl Marx said in thinking about and talking about the division of labor, he said, we're a stranger to the things that we make. And I sometimes feel a bit of a stranger to the things that I'm making, not, not because I want to be, but because the system uh, the, uh, the economy, uh, politics prevents me from kind of engaging more closely with the people I'd like to, the people who are going to live in the homes that, that, that we're designing. So, so I'll leave you with that one. It's not my project, but it's a, I think it's a good one. Thank you. With that, uh, we'll take one round of just three questions. And then uh, in the meanwhile, if people are interested, they can look at the drawings that are exhibited here or... Uh, the models in the next room, and uh, then we'll call it a day. So, three questions. That's fine, as far as I think. Okay. I, the juxtaposition of the two, the academic and uh, the professional work, uh, just raised two questions in my mind. Um, what I found uh, interesting is what you said that normally in academics when you, when you deal with housing, it goes in two directions, either utopian or, uh, or dumbed down due to uh, market realities. Whereas what is clear in the professional work is one cannot take an either or position. One has to do both and. And so because the two of you work together, I was interested in finding out how do you, in the academic space, not go either in one or the other direction, but bring the two together. And the other thing which intrigued me, which also happens with uh, housing projects in academics, is that because the problems or the site analysis uh, leads to a very complex understanding of various forces, one tries to provide a complex solution, but again, in the projects and the way you describe them, uh, what was clear was that you started with very simple actions of a street or a courtyard, rather than thinking of this complex design problem. So how do you, how do you tackle that in the academic uh, projects that uh, you give? I well, um, <coughs> very good questions. Um, is, it, is this on? Yeah. Um, well, I th the last question you, you talked about, making, making quite simple gestures on the site, I, I think this is something I forgot to mention, or perhaps is, is so ingrained in the way that we work that, that we take it for granted. But for us, design is a form of research, you see. So um, what we find is with a lot of studios, they go through a process where they do a tremendous amount of site analysis, and then they make a leap into uh, making a design proposal. 
Whereas what we tend to do, we, we tend to make um, a design move much earlier um, than, than many other design studios because we think that um, by making a proposition, you learn about what's happening in the site and so you, you start to imagine how um, an idea might, might work and, and that's a way of learning about the site. But it does require you to be very flexible and, and, and allow yourself um, the freedom to make lots of design changes. So, so typically with, with, with our students, they'll, they'll go through um, a number of, 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 of variations on a theme before settling on a, a design proposal. And the, f the, pre the first question you asked about the, I mean, that, that's very central to, to the way that we work, because it's, it's a dialogue. So Pete, Pete and I, I, I probably, um, I'm the academic, and so I'm, I'm, I'm sort of immersed, I do a lot of the cultural context teaching, the history and theory teaching, so I'm sort of more immersed in, in, in the, the history of architectural thinking, whereas, whereas Pete's very immersed in um, running a practice. And I think the, the, the studio works because of the dialogue between between us, you know, we, we, we both put uh, opposing, well not opposing, but, but complementary um, <laughs> <laughs> um, sort of um, backgrounds on, on the table and, and, and that, that's how it works. So, so it is this, this sort of dialogue between reality and utopia and, and hopefully students um, can, uh, can, 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 can feed off that in some way. So, yeah. No, no, that's good. Anybody else? Okay. I, I just want to um, really say that there's an incredible commitment in your work, in both of your work, um, and that commitment is to offer a, an alternative view to the kinds of architecture that we're seeing, these high-rise towers that are going up without any thought both in London and in Ahmedabad, and I'd love to see your Mount Pleasant project built. <laughs> okay, then maybe on that note, may I request uh, Professor Arthur Duff to give the word of thanks. So, uh, thank you, Ben and Pete, for a wonderful, generous demonstration of your commitment to architecture as in practice, as in teaching, and in both of you as in sharing. So it's a great opportunity for us to receive this, uh, without condition, uh, generous uh, commitment to architecture. So it's an inspiration for us, I think, here as uh, teachers and as students, and indeed those professionals who are here as well. So to thank you very much on behalf of FAAA for coming. And also, if I may thank our sponsor, Symphony, who are so generously behind the production and management of these uh, lectures and demonstrations, and to thank Shirayu, without whom very little would happen. So uh, on your all behalf, uh, to please give Pete and, and a very warm round of applause. Thank you very much.